Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today I'm very pleased to speak to Dr. Uthman Latif. How are you, Doctor? Alhamdulillah, It's good to have you on the, on, on the channel again. Nice to be here, thank you. Dr. Uthman is a senior researcher and instructor at Sapiens Institute. He has a BA in history, an MA in Crusader Studies, and has completed a PhD on the topic, Place of Fada'il al-Quds, Merits of Jerusalem, and Religious Poetry in the Muslim Effort to Recapture Jerusalem in the Crusades. He has delivered many papers in the UK and internationally at renowned academic institutions. His book on the Crusades, entitled The Cutting Edge of the Poet's Sword, Muslim Poetic Responses to the Crusades, was published by, by Brill in 2018. He has also written and continues to write academic articles and book chapters in the field of history. Today, Dr. Uthman is going to be speaking to us about how Christians engage or have engaged with the Islamic faith in their polemics and critiques of it. There will be a particular emphasis on two prominent Christian figures, John of Damascus and Thomas Aquinas. Dr. Rahman, whenever you're ready, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much. Perfect. Salam alaikum, my prayer, inshallah, all of you are well, and thank you so much for having me on uh, Blog Anthology once again, and wonderful meeting you, brother, but Samuel, Allah bless you and your health and your family, Allah, I mean. Uh, yeah, so the backstory of uh, my interest, in fact, in this article, aside from the fact that my, my, my work has been on the Crusades, and of course, a lot of this, in fact, taps into Crusader culture and crusader kind of generated thoughts and ideas that emerged from and before the crusades and as a consequence of the crusades aside from that uh, more recently in fact i came across a, a quite a popular christian youtube channel in which they were using uh, thomas aquinas and john of damascus in uh, attempts to characterize the character of the prophet muhammad sallam and uh, i really felt that this is uh, this is uh, old cliched and so incorrect and uh, i have to write something as a response to this and in fact i just finished writing the book my last book on divine perfection christianity and islam and salvation and uh it, it was quite fresh alhamdulillah in my mind to do something on this and may allah accept it therefore and then publish in this uh the the article of course is published by sapiens institute on, on our website and it's called polemics as caricature the false portrayal of prophet Salem by john damascus and thomas Christ. in fact it covers more than that but that's kind of like you mentioned the focus of the, the the chapter on these two key individuals. Uh, so, and and we'll, we'll be linking to your article in the description box. Perfect, perfect. May Allah bless you. Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, I want to begin, in fact, with quite a nice quote here by Michael Curtis from his book, Orientalism and Islam, European Thinkers on Oriental Despotism in the Middle East and India. Now, he says that rivalry and often enmity con continued between the European Christian world and the Islamic world. For Christian theologians, the other was the infidel, the Muslim. Theological disputes in Baghdad and Damascus in the 8th to 10th century and in Andalusia up to the 14th century led Christian Orthodox and Byzantine theologians and rulers to continue seeing Islam as a threat. One of my books, in fact, in fact, two of my books are, in fact, are about the mechanism of othering and dehumanization. Uh, and my postdoctor, in fact, was in, particularly in that field. And I wrote a book uh, called uh, uh, On Being Human, How Islam Addresses Othering, Dehumanization and Empathy. And in fact, some of these things in fact, are covered in that book. The book was written after the Christchurch Massacre in New Zealand in 2019 as a way for us, therefore, to understand how these mechanisms are created and what damage they do, in fact, to the human being oneself and, of course, in our perceptions of what we call the other uh, in terms of another person. There are, of course, different mechanisms of that to do with uh, othering as in structural otherness and othering as in geographical distance, distance in terms of culture and identity. But of course, in this respect, also in terms of religion, and that's in fact quite a dangerous thing. Uh, Michael Curtis's remark, I think, is quite interesting because he pinpoints uh, rivalry. And that, of course, is quite a strong Quranic motif, in fact, about Thanafos, about rivalry. The fact that people, of course, can be uh, can go to an extreme in an overindulgence in something uh, based upon rivalry with somebody else. Uh, in this context, of course, it's the fact that when 
Islam emerged in the landscape of the world, I mean, Islam as in, of course, we believe Islam is a universal truth, a universal religion, but Islam as in the, the coming of the Prophet and the rise of Islam, the very rapid expansion of Islam, uh, it was difficult for Christians to understand what exactly was happening here. Uh, Christians, of course, see themselves or saw themselves and still see themselves as as the uh, as the ultimate kind of uh, manifestation of God's um, you know salvation plan for human beings, and to find therefore a, a religion emerge uh, and uh, lead to large amounts of people embracing that faith and the the rapid kind of uh, conquering of territories, it was difficult for them to understand what exactly was happening here. And one of the things that Michael Curtis pinpoints here is the fact that there was rivalry and they couldn't understand uh, how Islam could be so successful so quickly. I remember that when I was doing my undergraduate degree, in fact, my, my BA degree, uh, we were in a room uh, in a seminar session. And I remember that the uh, teacher was giving out these maps about the uh, different conquests of the world. They had the Roman conquest and the Persian conquest. And then all of a sudden you have the Arab conquest and you have these huge chunks taken out you know, from uh, parts of the world. And one of the uh, students asked the teacher, he said, uh, how did this all happen? How did, the, how did the Arabs do that so quickly? And uh, the teacher said, uh, quite honestly, he said, he said, I, he said, we don't fully know the the, the full extent of, of the why, but of the how, sorry. But one thing that we do know is that they truly believed that Muhammad was a prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that, in fact, was a major motivation, of course, for them to do what they did. It was simply based upon the fact they believed Islam was true. And so uh, it says for Christian theologians, the other was the infidel, the Muslim uh, theological disputes in Baghdad. And these, of course, are major centers of Muslim rule, Baghdad, Damascus, uh, Islamic Spain, and Andalusia, uh, led to a Christian clergy of the Orthodox and Byzantine theologians to see Islam as a threat, and a threat in, in different senses. So if we want to cover many of these, inshallah, in the course of this presentation. Now, here we are. This is from the Theophanes, in fact, was a, a very famous uh, uh, monk. He was from the 8th century, and he says that uh, he was baffled by Islam's continuing success. Theophanes does not pretend to know what God has in mind. This is from John Tolan in his book on uh, the Saracen, Islam in Medieval European Imagination. In fact, Theophanes, in fact, was the one who, uh, similar, in fact, to John of Damascus and Thomas Aquinas, who, begin to, who began to um, invent uh, I mean, in a very fantastical way, uh, an explanation for why people were embracing Islam. Mm. He was one, in fact, that came out with the the fantastical idea that the Muhammad had epilepsy. In fact, that's his that's his idea. So, so then, uh, that's Theophanes, and and also the idea. In fact, he has a very kind of elaborate story to try and explain the rise of Islam in his text. And he says that you know uh, Muhammad had epilepsy, so and uh, his wife Khadija uh, saw this happening. And it, as a way of covering his tracks, he says that. Uh, but I'm a prophet of God, and I have this divine revelation, and therefore she kind of excused him for that based upon uh, the uh, the claims of, of of his. This is kind of Theophanes' idea behind what's happening. Happening here, uh, so Theophanes. So, in fact, so Theophanes. I mean, just so that our, our listeners who may not be familiar with him, yeah. I, I I just googled him up quickly. So he he died in the early ninth century. Yeah, that's right. T e. Okay, just so that we have some context. Okay, hmm. it's called Theophanes the Confessor, mm, yeah. the monk. So born in the eighth and then died in the ninth century, and so therefore. He kind of uh, made these allegations and said, for example, that Islam is so different because they don't pray in churches, they pray in their own kind of centers called mosques. He says that um, that when uh, the Jews embraced Islam, they turned their back on Moses. So kind of he's creating a kind of divide between Islam and what and what we believe in terms of universal truth as in all the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so he says, that, so, so, so Toden says that Theophanes was baffled by Islam's continuing success and does not pretend to know what God has in mind you know, for, for what Islam uh, is going to do, what Islam is, 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 is purpose to do. I put down here kind of a few things for us to think about. One, the fact that you have conversions to Islam. Uh, now that, of course, is, uh, is, a, is a point because uh, people from all faiths, of course, are embracing Islam quite quickly. And there are different reasons for people embracing Islam. The, the whole 
rise of Islam is, uh, you know, you had, of course, on the one hand, professional du'a, the professional calls to Islam, like Muad ibn Jabal going to Yemen or Musa ibn Umar going to uh, Medina. Uh, you had others who were famous, like uh, social influencers who embraced Islam, like the kings of Mali, for example, led people in Africa to embrace Islam, or the Buddhist uh, uh, the Buddhist king of Kashmir it became Muslim, and everybody else became Muslim in Kashmir. But you also had, of course, the fact that Muslims are settling in areas and and you know for for trade, like in Yemen, for example, or in the southern ports of India and other places as well, and they're kind of settling there. And Islam is growing because of what they're seeing of the uh, of the honesty and decency and, and fair trading and, and good dealing of Muslim traders in this. Uh, but in any case, as Islam is growing in these different contexts and different kind of situations, uh, Christians are wondering what's actually happening here because it seems as if God's approval is coming to these new newcomers, new new people, and and that's something that of course uh, became a cause of consternation for for Christians and Christian clergy in particular. You also have here the Pact of Umar, because the Pact of sorry, Pact of Medina, because the Pact of Medina, of course, gave uh, great rights, in fact, to Christians and Jews in Medina, and of course, following on from that, you have, of course, conquest of Jerusalem and Umar's Pact of of Medina of, of Jerusalem. Uh, these, in fact, were crucial because they kind of uh, were treaties. There were ways in which. Muslims expressed their willingness, their desire to live uh, with Christians, particularly uh, in, a, in, a, in a case of, of peacefulness and, and conviviality and, and coexistence. Uh, this, of course, was it kind of it, it, it sets against it goes against the tide of, of a culture of othering, because here you have Muslims, in fact, embracing the fact that we can live. We do, of course, differ, differ with on, on in terms of the, uh, theological terms, but we can, of course, uh, coexist. Um, Muslims, of course, gave Christians rights in this respect, and you have uh, delineations in those ordinances about not uh, disturbing Christian celebrations or breaking the crucifix is, is forbidden or destroying like monuments of Christians are all forbidden. Uh, and therefore, that was kind of a, a case in point as well. And what these kind of lead to, in the words of people like Maria Rosa Manacol, um in her book on Al Andalusia, is um, is the conv- convivency. In fact, means coexistence. And you have great examples of coexistence between Muslims and Christians. Uh, Al Andalus, of course, is a, is a famous example in Cordoba. But other cases, in fact, Al Quds, Jerusalem, in fact, was an example of convivencia as well. Um, Muslims, these these three kind of major faiths living, in fact, together. Uh, and of course, uh, and here we have, of course, a model of justice in the Quran. Allah does not forbid you from dealing kindly and fairly with those who have neither fought you nor driven you out of your homes. Surely Allah loves those who are fair. So a key verse, therefore, in the Quran about the fact that we're not supposed to live in perpetual uh, antagonism, perpetual animosity, perpetual warfare, you know, with, with people, because Allah is saying here that, you know, if people have not waged war against you, there's no need for you to wage war against them. And there is, of course, uh, there is the idea that Allah doesn't forbid you from dealing kindly with those who have not waged war against you. And of course, this happened in many cases as well, and and Muslims, uh, you know, took that uh, verse to heart. And so, therefore, a, a few examples historically of the fact that you know you have certain things in place, and they're enabling Christians to uh, to see Islam kind of in a in a positive light. And uh, this kind of goes against the other the kind of sense of otherness that we have. Uh, people like Theophanes and others are trying to create uh, about Muslims. Um, so. Now, these are kind of, here we have relational dynamics. So what's actually happening here and why it's happening? So on the one hand, we have Christian perceptions of the Prophet and Islam. So how are they perceiving of Islam and the Prophet of Islam? Uh, one of, some of the earliest, in fact, uh, perceptions are like seeing the Prophet as like this, uh, a heresy arc. Heresiarch is like a, a, a kind of a founder of a heresy, and uh, that's how they're seeing him. So, as opposed to seeing Islam as so kind of uh, new in terms of a different religion per se, they're seeing Islam as a heresy, as a Christian kind of heresy, as something that kind of takes something from Christianity, borrows a bit from here, from Judaism, and wraps it all together and kind of comes up with this new thing, and um, and uh, and that's how they're seeing it. So they're seeing they're, they're seeing the Prophet as, as 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 bad because he founds a, a new her- finds a new heresy, and they're seeing Islam as a heretical belief. And this is, by the way, e- even even before the Crusades, like in the 
end of the 11th century, you still have this kind of stuff in, in poetry and in, in depicting the Prophet as a heresiarch and Islam as a heresy. So it's kind of, it's, it's, it's passing there for the 8th, the 9th century date is kind of continue, con, con, continuing on. Um, and then of course, what that leads to is it, it leads to, just like they would write polemics against other heretics, in that time they were writing uh, her, uh, pol uh, polemics against Islam uh, in that same category. In fact, even uh, John Damascus and Aquinas both write about Islam in that context of, of heresies. In fact, they don't write specific books on Islam, but Islam as one of those, one of the heresies uh, that's kind of, you know, from the devil and so on and so forth. Um, they they see Islam, this is interesting because Islam is a punishment for Christian sin. So, uh, and that's kind of quite a, a big thing because uh, if you look, for example, at Anastasius of Sinai, for example, of the 8th century, uh, seeing, of course, Islam, you saw, in fact, Islam as a punishment for the fact that your emperors like Constans persecuting Orthodox Church, and therefore God sends Islam as a punishment for that. Uh, or John of Nikiu, who was interesting because he was from the uh, anti Chalcedonians, you know, he was like Orthodox Egyptian, uh, but he was against the uh, the, the Council of uh, Chalcedonia, Chalcedon, and uh, didn't believe, therefore, in the kind of, uh, you know, the two kind of, uh, two parts of Jesus Christ as being part God, part human. These were like monophysites. These were like people believed in one kind of divine nature. And uh, he rejected kind of uh, Chalcedon. And, uh, and so, therefore, they saw Islam as a punishment for for Chalcedonia Christians, you know, so very interesting. Um, and you had, other, you had others like that as well. Even as late, for example, as uh, the arrival of Muslims into Al Andalus in 711, you have, of course, this kind of a conflict between the Visigoths because you have a civil war 710 and uh, the sons of Witiza fighting against King Roderick. And uh, many Visigoths saw. Islam as a punishment for their own sins because they kind of descended into in, internal conflict between themselves and therefore God sends a, a Islam as a punishment for them to go back to God and seek forgiveness and so on and so forth. Um, and so that's quite a quite a kind of a, a, a typical way of understanding what Islam was. It's a it's a big kind of a, a heresy and is a punishment for, for Christians for the fact that they've kind of distanced themselves from God and a way for them to go back to God was of course was to clean up the heresy of Islam. And then, of course, you have the big episodes of the Crusades, and this became really crucial, in fact, in terms of, um, you know, uh, in terms of perception of, of of Islam and Muslims, and and the Crusades, in fact, was was a big one because uh, when the Crusades, in fact, I mean, the genesis of the Crusades was in fact in Andalus in Spain; it wasn't even in in, in Europe, in France, and. And uh, the fact that you have uh, popes like Gregory the Seventh and Urban II, these were, these were these were in fact reform popes, reform papacy. And what that meant was that they were kind of very much against the ideas of things like simony and and indulgence and sorry simony uh, and an investiture, and they wanted to almost like clean up the house of Christianity from the inside, a bit like what Al Ghazali was doing in Islam in terms of trying to clean up the house of Islam from the inside, and um, and so when that happened, in fact. Uh, you had the first, uh, you know, first proclamations of of of, a, of an indulgence for Christians if they fight against Muslims in Spain, and the language, therefore, of otherness of the Turks, of the savages, of the Saracens, in fact, emerged from this time onwards, um, and so the kind of a characterized image of Islam and Muslims as being a, of the existential other emerges, therefore, uh, from uh, Al Andalus, from Spain before the Crusades, but then, of course, when the Crusades happen, uh, that's that's the big one because uh, now of course they're entering into Islamic lands and uh, and one of the uh, one of the court one of the speeches of, of urban II therefore this many of course there's four or five surviving accounts of his speech was to fight against the pagans um and this emerges because not just because of urban speech but even before that like for example we have the chant song the Ro the Roland the, Ro the song of Roland and this is by a man called Roland who was uh uh, this is 11th century. This is before the fact that the official crusades, and uh, in his song, and he's in fact writing about uh, Christian knights and everything else fighting, you know, from Europe. But he depicts the Muslims as pagan idolaters. 
So Muslims being idolatrous and pagans, heathen, uh, and that's an image. And therefore, that image therefore caught on because Urban used a similar kind of image in his propaganda speeches in the Crusades. So therefore, the chants on the Roland, for example, you have uh, others like Adamar um, of uh, Shaban is another one, for example. You have quite a few therefore emerging in this time, particularly in the 12th century, uh, therefore typifying the Muslims as being others and savages and Turks and and uh, and of course pagans like in, in the example of the chanson de Roland for example um, and then of course Muslims of course are responding to this stuff and even before the 12th century uh, people like uh, Ibn Hazm for example from Al-Andalus uh, uh, Spain uh, writes his uh, long text uh, refuting Christians in fact he would believed that Muslims are so Christians are have altered their text and changed things from their places. And so Al Juwaini, for example, the teacher of Al Ghazali, Al Juwaini, in fact, uh, said something similar to, uh, to Ibn Hazm in the fact that he gives examples of that textual kind of alteration in his text as well. Shahrastuni, Al Mil wa Nihal, for example, a very lengthy text uh, focusing on uh, discrepancies in the Bible and alterations in the Bible. And so, therefore, Muslims, therefore, are kind of responding to these, uh, you know, attempts by Christians in in in, uh, in 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 responding to Islam, and this is kind of happening back back and forth. Um, and then, of course, uh, you have so, so therefore these kind of three or four early things happening between the Christians and the Muslims, perceptions being raised about what Islam is, who the Prophet was, uh, Christian anti-Islamic polemics. Islam is a punishment for Christian sin, the Crusades, and Muslim reputation of. Christianity. And then, of course, I mean, this is, of course, now taking it all the way back to the 20th century. You have closer affinities. This is kind of giving a bit of a kind of a backdrop about how perceptions were created, how they changed, and some of the reasons why. Uh, and so, closer affinities, this is like, of course, the Catholic Church, Second Vatican Council, uh, Lumen Gentium, and this is 16 November 20, 21, 1964. But the plan of salvation also includes those who acknowledge the Creator in the first place amongst them, amongst whom are the Muslims. These profess to hold the faith of Abraham, and together with us, they adore, adore the one merciful God, mankind's judge on the last day. And likewise, Paul the sixth. This is the same year. Uh, then we refer to the adorers of God according to the conception of monotheism, the Muslim religion, especially deserving of our admiration of all that is true and good in their worship of God. The interesting thing, it doesn't begin, in fact, from this point onwards, because you have people like William of Malsbury, 12th century. And even Malsbury, for example, is saying similar th stuff. He's saying things like, for example, even though he believed that Islam was a punishment for Christian sin, he said the same thing. But he says that uh, the, the Muslims and Jews both believe in in the father is what he says in the father and therefore in that sense they, they hold on to a monotheism uh that they have to be you know appraised uh for that purpose uh but therefore the the perceptions of of christians toward muslims has of course developed over time depending of course on the denomination one belongs to um but the kind of th through and through you'll find this kind of early sense of antagonism otherness and you know as time progresses and they become more alert to what islam is then of course the those feelings can, uh, and they, they did in many cases, uh, change. Uh, would you, now, would you say, based on their writings, that the pagan allegation yeah. mainly had to do with tawaf around the Kaaba and praying towards the Kaaba? Or do you think that there was something else that, um, <laughs> that you based this allegation on? Because, I mean, uh, just looking at many Christian polemicists today, you know, it, it appears to me that, you know, kiss, kissing the black stone and praying towards the Kaaba or their primary reasons for maybe, you know, yeah, Thomas Aquinas uh, raising this allegation. Yeah. Do you think yeah, Aquinas, writing Aquinas, that's the same yeah. thing? It's true. Aquinas, in fact, has some stuff like that. <laughs> it makes kind of similar kind of allegations. But I think that on those examples of like, uh, uh, where they like the, ch the ch chanson de Roland, for example, I don't think in fact, it's that developed. I think, because of course it's a song, and in the song he's simply using like lyrical verse and and drawing and trying to whip up a, a fervor amongst the people. Likewise, in fact, in the crusade, because the purpose of the crusade was not to be, uh, not to specifically try and uh, uh, you know refute Islam yeah. in any sense. It was more like 
to justify it. <laughs> yeah, justify people. it. Yeah. Give them a kind of a sense of reason to go and fight there. And remember, he's his speeches to to people who are thieves and murderers and rapists, and of course, they, he's giving them a kind of a chance of salvation. And here you have these heathen, abominable uh, pagans over there. If you fight against them, then you have forgiveness of all sins, and therefore that was kind of the the main thing behind it. Uh, now, of course, in, in today's world, you know, you have these Christian uh, missionary evangelists. In fact, that use kind of very simplistic reasoning, like the one that you. Presented in not understanding, of course, the, the purpose of things, but a kind of a kind, a kind of a cheap shot against uh, trying to, uh, you know, misrepresent the faith of Islam. Um, so going back a bit, so here we have, of course, the Iberian Peninsula of the Crusading. Now, during, of course, that time, you have, of course, uh, Muslims like uh, the first, uh, the first kind of Shafi'i Faqih who authors his text as a response to the First Crusade, called Kitab al-Jihad. And his name was Ali ibn Tad al-Sulami, and the Shafi uh, Faqih of Damascus, uh, Umayyad Mosque. And he, in fact, uh, brings these three uh, events together of the fact that you have the the, the taking over of, of Spain and then the Sicily, and now, of course, Al-Quds. He kind of, he, he kind of makes that point. Uh, but, of course, for the Christians themselves, they're also worrying about those three locations as well. Um, but during the time, in fact, of the Christians and Muslims in, in Spain, you have uh, a lot happening because here you have Muslims coming to uh, the Visigothic people who are, of course, all Christians. They have, of course, Civil War 710. Uh, by the time they get there, the Muslims, of course, are creating these amazing, like the, the Pact of Omar, uh, amazing. Uh, you have the Pact of Theodomar, in fact, by the, the, the son of Musa ibn Nusayr, you know, with the Christians of Theodomar. Again, similar stuff that you can't uh, destroy crucifixes, you can't destroy the whatever like you can't destroy christian monuments and it allows it for the christians to have this sense of uh you know livability you know with the muslims aside from the fact that many are em embracing islam except the the physical nobility who are traveling far up north into the mountains of astorias and, and galicia to try and escape from this and and that's happening but by the time you get to uh Abdurrahman the second so now you're kind of in the ninth century uh, you have the rise of the Mozarabs. The Mozarabs are like the Musta'arrabin, meaning the ones who are so impressed by Islam, Christians are now addressing like the Arabs and uh, trying to emulate the Arabs in their eating habits and their dress code and and learning Arabic, of course, is, is a key thing, writing Arabic. And this became a great source of uh, consternation and fear and worry for the Christian clergy because they couldn't understand that's like we're losing our we're losing our people to the Muslims. And uh, so what began, therefore, is a what's called a Christian martyr movement. So you have uh, priests like uh, Alvarez and Eulogius, and they're trying to convince other Christians in Cordoba to uh, insult Islam in the public square and they get killed for it. And therefore, that would kind of uh, give a rise to to martyrdom, uh, martyrdoms. Um, and this was really, an, uh, it was a false fanaticism, but it was an attempt to push back in their, in their minds against the rise of Islam in that time. So the Mazar became, and the Mazar are the one, in fact, that became Muslims afterwards, they really embraced Islam afterwards. But in the early stage, it was simply impressed by Islam and uh, would simply just adopt a Muslim, uh, you know, Muslim cultural kind of practices as a way for them to kind of, you know, feel comfortable with that. Um, and so Eulogius of Cordoba, who wrote that the church of the Orthodox groans beneath his most grievous yoke and is beaten to destruction. He's, of course, complaining about the rise of Islam in this. Um, and he's, in fact, writing his text, uh, the Memorial Sanctorum, of Eulogius Cordoba, in fact, for two uh, Christian women, uh, uh, Maria, uh, one was one, Maria, one was uh, somebody else, two, and he's trying to convince these two girls to uh, take part in these martyrdom uh, uh, events, you know, by a public square, insult Islam, uh, do something against the Quran, and it would kind of uh, lead to the martyrdom. But he kind of believed that to be a good thing. And this was, in fact, was not the first time it's happened because remember that even when Islam was growing early on, uh, in the time of people like uh, Theophanes, uh, the, 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 the confessor, you had this idea that the 
the the blood of of virgin martyrs was more sanctified you know for, from that point onwards that if you had women for example who gave their lives you know for jesus and refusing to accept islam that sanctified blood uh, was more precious with god and that's something the fact that existed from that time onwards so you have, have this uh, element that the, the 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 struggle is more worthy now because there's more of a, of a price to pay for it and so people like eulogias of cordoba were, were kind of uh, emphasizing that um and so uh here's an example of from so alvarez in fact was the, the main priest of cordoba and he says the christians love to read this is his kind of complaint uh against uh the mozarabs a, a complaint against christians who are so fascinated by islam and arabic culture he says that the christians love to read the poems and romances of the arabs they studied the arab theologians and philosophers not to refute them but to form a correct and elegant arabic where is the layman who now reads the Latin com commentaries on the Holy Scriptures, or who studies the Gospels, prophets, or apostles? Alas, all talented young Christians read and study with enthusiasm the Arab books. They gather immense libraries at great expense. They despise the Christian literature as unworthy of attention. They have forgotten their language. For every one who can write a letter in Latin to a friend, there are thousands who can express themselves in Arabic with elegance, and write a better poem in this language than the Arabs themselves. May, I, may, may Allah revive these days. I mean, Allah, I mean. So therefore, Abdul Mahdi second, in fact, he kind of uh, had to uh, work closely with the, uh, the 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 bishop, in fact, of Cordoba about how to solve this problem. And uh, one of the steps, in fact, that really worked was to try and restrict the, the dhimmi status of Christians, that if they kind of carry on, then those kind of privileges would be, have to kind of be held back from them. And in, by the way, even when this was happening, he never forbade the Christian bells from ringing on Sundays, for example, or Christian uh, funerals passing through court. He never forbade those things, even when these uh, martyrdom attempts were happening. Uh, but I think when the, they, they kind of uh, specified restrictions Dhimmi, Dhimmi kind of status, uh, you had a kind of a sudden stop uh, to this happening. So that's kind of a you know, case in point, I think, for for uh, Al-Andalus. Um, now, in this case, here we are, so we're kind of back, backing up a bit, a bit as well. So what I was speaking about earlier, um, yeah, so the 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 fact that people like Gregory Seventh and Evan Second are part of the Cluniac Reform papacy, uh, they're trying to seek, they're trying to reform. But but remember that the reforms are not just about uh, like uh, you know sm small smaller things to do with practice and and faith. They're to do with the fact that. Uh, authority ideally should belong to the Pope, papal authority, as opposed to belong to the emperor, and this became really a big point. In fact, uh, this this really is the reason, in many ways, for the crusade. It's not just about the fact that they're using, of course, uh, Islam as a scapegoat, Muslim as a scapegoat, and therefore de 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 demonizing and dehumanizing them. But re the reality is, is that they're they're kind of having their own problem in house, and what that meant was that. Uh, you know, when you had, of course, the schism between the Catholics and the, and the Orthodox Church, uh, the question was about, one of the questions was about, you know, where does where does full temporal authority remain and, and sit? Uh, and on the one hand, of course, you're arguing, well, you know, the, 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 the emperor, of course, he has temporal authority on earth, and God has authority in heaven. And the, the popes are saying, well, the, the Pope should have all authority on earth, uh, and of course, that includes temporal authority in terms of warfare, being declaring war. Whereas previous to that, of course, it would be the emperor who would declare war. And so when Urban II, for example, and even Gregory VII announced crusades, like in El Andalus, Spain, in Tarragona, for example, or uh, from Claremont to Jerusalem, uh, it was a way of flexing muscle. It was a way of the Pope uh, showing that the Pope can declare war as opposed to the emperor declaring, because it was a new thing. Um, and therefore, uh, in doing this, it was a way of kind of uh, showing the the rest of the Christian world that the the Catholic Pope really is in control is in control here. Um, and so, therefore, if you look at, for example, 
this is one example of uh, Urban Seconds preaching. There are like four remaining uh, 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 surviving accounts. They all say a bit, a bit because they're all written after the event. They all say a bit different things. But this is folklore of charts, and he says, "All who die, by the way, whether by land or by sea, or in battle against the pagans, that is, of course, the Muslims, shall have immediate remission of sins." So therefore, if you're fighting against pagans, uh, that that's uh, in their minds justified to fight against pagans. This I grant them through the power of God. Uh, with which I am invested. Oh, what a disgrace of such a despised and base race which worships demons. That is, of course, Muslims worshipping demons. Should I could conquer a people which has the faith of om omnipotent God and is made glorious through the name of Christ? Therefore, that juxtaposition is very clear, therefore, because juxtaposing, on the one hand, uh, what they think is monotheism, and of course, then with, with idolatry of, of the Muslims. And it became, of course, a big incentive for many who went and fight against the crusade, uh, Muslims in the crusade because they're seeing th th this is a valid fight against a, a heathen pagan enemy and um and this is what happens so this is kind of one example so demonizing therefore of muslims uh you know became a very obvious thing in in the crusades and of course other other motives were non-religious because you had people are fighting for land for uh for settling in, in in another place so or wealth for example not everything in fact was motivated by religion in that time it was kind of other secular motives uh, as well at that time um uh, at the same time what's happening however this, in fact, connects a lot to John of Damascus' uh, his time because uh, when Islam emerges, of course, the Jews are, are kind of uh, see something similar in, uh, to the Christian because they're seeing Islam as a new phenomenon. Um, and although, of course, Muslims had lived with the Jews previously in 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 the Hijaz, you know, in in, in Medina, for example, uh, the one of the one of the things is that you have this kind of an uh, holy or unholy alliance between Muslims and Jews in this time, because of the fact that they they they're closer they're closer in, mon in monotheism than of course the Christians are, and this kind of works both ways because you have of course. Uh, let's say, for example, if you take uh, the, the Inquisition in Spain in the 14th century, uh, 15th century, you have both Muslims and Jews c collectively together involved in the persecution because of the refusal to accept the Trinity. Right, therefore, that kind of creates a bit of a bond between. I was in Sarajevo just last year, and you have the largest, uh, one of the largest, in fact, Hebrew cemeteries in Sarajevo, and uh, and on on the uh, on the tombstones of of these uh, on of these tombs, you have the script of Lad Ladino. Ladino is a Spanish dialect, Ladino, uh, and they're all Jews. So, how do you get a Spanish dialect in? tombstones all the way in Bosnia and Sarajevo is because when they were kicked out of uh, London State, they were they sought safety with the Uthmani Khilafa in, in Bosnia, and they gave them safe haven, and that's kind of how why you have Ladino on uh, on the tombstones of uh, of that cemetery in, in Sarajevo. So it's one example, a small example, but it's many examples like that of the fact that whenever they were victims of pogroms by Christians, they would oftentimes find safety and refuge in, with the Muslims. Uh, in in the theological Logical sense, of course, it says uh, for this is for, from Thomas Wienandi from Does God Change the Worlds Becoming in the Incarnation? Uh, it is worth reminding ourselves that the novel revelation of Islam only reinforced the original Jewish resistance that God is one, which had figured trenchantly in the early elaboration of Christian doctrine. Why else can we surmise that it took four centuries to clarify the central teachings of Christianity about Jesus? Uh, this is, of course, the uh, Council of Charles Sudan, out of which a full-blown Trinitarian doctrine emerged. So, uh, Jews found, of course, comfort in the Muslims because of their declaration in Tawheed of the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the the Muslims also realized that the Jews don't accept belief in the Trinity. And that kind of creates this kind of an alliance between the Muslims and, 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 and the Jews. This is in one case. The other example where this really plays out is in terms of the struggle of uh, iconoclasm. Uh, 
So when you have, of course, uh, now Jonah Damascus is going to write a lot about uh, the the validity of of icons and and worshiping and and, and praying and kind of revering these icons, and Jews are heavily against that, and so too are Muslims, and uh, Muslims and Jews, in fact, kind of create this kind of counterculture uh, to the the worship of uh, or reverence of of icons, the in, in iconoclasm, and this in fact becomes another point uh, during that time. And so, therefore, uh, events you know thereafter, like the Iberian Peninsula, and even when, in fact, when the Muslims before the Muslims arrived in 11, you had, of course, the, the, the you had the Fourth Council of, of uh, Toledo, and in that council, the Jews were uh, typified as being, uh, you know, uh, un, like they, they said, for example, uh, that we need to do to do Jews. Like we have to expel, we have to make sure that uh, Jewish kids don't remain with their parents because they become further entangled in the deviation. So it's forced baptism, forced conversion, uh, you know, forced kind of expulsion from the land. And this is before the Muslims, in fact, came to Jerusalem. So when the Muslims arrived, they gave the Jews rights, in fact. They allowed them back in, they gave them rights, they kind of, you know, made them, uh, in, in uh, Abdul Rahman III's uh, diplomat was, main one was Hastai ibn Shabrut, and he's, of course, a Jewish person. Maimonides, in fact, is living in Al-Andalus, and he becomes Salah Hadin's physician as well, Maimonides. So they, therefore, we never have, have we never had a problem in that respect, and therefore, that's something for us to remember. Uh, and here comes, of course, the, the first individual of our uh, of the article that I wrote, uh, Jonah Damascus. Uh, Jonah Damascus was named Yohanna ibn Mansur ibn Sarjun, and he, his, his case is interesting because he was the financial governor of Damascus when the city was captured by uh, the Prophet's companion, Khalid bin Walid, Allah be pleased with him. So this is going back, you know, right all the way back to early Islam. Uh, therefore, his so his kind of, his relevance is very key here. He's seeing the rise of Islam, he's seeing the, the first uh, Prophet's companions and their successors settling in those lands of Islam. His grandfather, also Mansur ibn Sarjan, was promoted to the high highest position in the Khilafah and the Muawiyah. Uh, so, uh, you know, important kind of uh, important events happening in his time, of course, this will kind of have an effect on his his frame of thinking about what this uh, faith actually is. And he may have had an even more favorable position as a person. So therefore, he's kind of privileged in, in many respects, because he's given this uh, a prominent role, in fact, in the Muslim government. He was a tax collector and well-paid job. So the, the early part of his life, in fact, until he gets to like to his 50s, I think, uh, was really spent, you know, living with the Muslims and uh, enjoying kind of the, the comfort of having a favorable position in the government, working him and his family, in fact, uh, you know, under the Muslim rule. And it shows a kind of a degree of trust also between the Muslims and, uh, and the Christians who are native to that land at that time. Yeah, um, so, so no one can say that being mistreated was some yeah, kind of, of course. motive. Yeah. Of course, of course, of course, yeah, of course. Now, he neither had an accurate understanding, this is a key thing, because during Damascus, he neither has an accurate understanding of Islam nor of the Prophet from his own admission, by the way, nor of the Quran. So while he knew some details from a few surahs, he relied predominantly on con conversations with his co-religionists and with Muslims. So what he does, you know, Damascus, is he begins to write against heresies, like I mentioned before. Uh, and that, of course, takes him then to and this. Is he is he writing all this openly under Muslim rule? I mean, because apparently Damascus was conquered, right? Yeah, uh, for sure, for sure. Yeah, the, the impression is kind of he's writing later on, uh, but it would be writing in, with some degree of secrecy because he, he can't, of course, uh, you know, proclaim that. Uh, and of course, of course, the, the, the Muslims never had a problem with uh, debating with Christians. Yeah. On a public platform, anyway, that, that I mean, that could happen, you know. But I think that you know, for people like him uh, and Aquinas, because Aquinas is kind of more crusade kind of focused. Um, there was a need to, in, in his mind, to safeguard the the community of Christians uh, by by kind of uh, responding to to Muslims and Islam. The point is not that. I mean, that's always happened anyway. It's not. That's not the point. The point is the the degree of inaccuracy. Uh, with which this is being done. That's that's the problem. It's with it's the way kind of the the 
the prophet is caricaturized, he's caricatured, he's kind of shown to be something that he isn't, and Islam isn't that thing. And people like Jonathan Damascus, who in fact knew Arabic, therefore he had a- access to Islamic sources, he should have known better uh, in, in the situation. And so his level of uh, of uh, being wrong is, is, I think, phenomenal. Mm-hmm. I mean, the extent to which he makes mistakes, the extent to which he, he lies, manufactures things, it's uh, really abysmal. And I think that it's a shame that Christian missionaries are relying on him today. And in fact, this is how my journey about learning about him started, because I saw a clip. I won't name the, the YouTube Christian channel, but I don't want to give any public. But, but I saw the clip where they're using uh, Jonathan Damascus in his attempts to uh, characterize the Prophet And I thought, well, this is 21st century, and you're still using like such old... Uh, old kind of uh, worn out cliched perceptions of Islam that kind of everybody else has kind of refuted but you're still stuck with that and it shows you have nothing else to offer except you have you have these kind of sad sad pathetic attempts and so therefore he has a, a few stories of details and you're like primarily on on conversation with people now key verses when and this is a key point because there are of course key verses in the Quran uh, where you know the, the the clear understanding of of Muslims belief towards Jesus is very unequivocal it's very clear but these went unnoticed by Jonah Damascus and like for example chapter 5 verse 72 uh, where Allah says they do blaspheme those who say Allah is Christ son of Mary لَقَدْ كَفَرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا they disbelieve those who say that Allah is the son of Mary uh, but something uh, as as big as that kind of went, un- went unnoticed by John of Damascus it refers to the Quran as separate books so as opposed to kind of one text from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, revealed over time. He reveals them as separate books uh, that the Muslims are bringing. And its fourth chapter, he entitles The She Camel. Uh, now, of course, we do have a reference in the Quran of Naqatullah, of, of yeah. the She Camel of Allah. Uh, but he he turns this into a separate chapter, it con- concocts this really fantastical story, in fact, in his text about what the she camel is and all this whole story that has nothing to do with anything Quranic. Uh, but again, he's, he's appealing to his audience because they're ignorant, just like he's ignorant of Islam. And uh, and they buy into it because it's coming from John of Damascus. And he spends most of his time on this image. I've, I've kind of quoted it here in full here. According to John, the Quran tells the following story that there, were, there was a camel who drank an entire river until she became so fat, she could not squeeze herself past two mountains. Right, that's the first thing. Now, she was uh, later killed by an evil people, but her small she camel offspring survived. This small she camel is raised up to paradise, whereas John claims it, it will drink the entire river of wine and become drunk. Now, when the she camel is drunk, it will be too intoxicated to stay awake and will fall unconscious. The she camel then enters the souls of donkeys and possesses asses. John ends his analysis of this non-existent surah by saying that if Muslims follow the Prophet, they too will become donkeys. Now, right. therefore, you, 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 know, like, like you can't even give any kind of excuse. Uh, <laughs> you know, I was, I'm even thinking: is there some fabricated hadith or narration? Yeah. That uh, and he confused it for the Quran. There's a, it's a, it's a complete fabrication. Complete, yeah. Completely. I mean, there's yeah. nothing at all nothing. like this in Israeli art or weak hadith yeah. or nothing, nothing, yeah. nothing in this. Yeah. And so, therefore, he's obviously imagined this and wrote it and presented it as fact to his people. Now, of course, you can understand how perceptions of Islam were created because John Damascus is kind of a is heavyweight in that tradition. And when he says something, of course, it's seen as coming from a, from an authority like the like a salaf, like the early 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 Christians mm. uh, who knew about Islam, because the, the, the perception of knowing about Islam, living with the Muslims, of course, that's that's uh, true. In fact, he lived with the Muslims, but his uh, attempts to uh, you know uh, create these false uh, you know. Uh, depictions of Islam and the Quran are quite appalling and this is one example that he spends most of his time on this story of the she camel which of course has nothing uh, Islamic about it you know so that's kind of one example of, of him now this is interesting because um, and this again is from now if you've read my book you notice that uh I spend a, a very lengthy section, uh, a lengthy chapter on this and and, uh, and it really, really piqued my interest because 
what I when I was writing the book, in fact, what I uncovered was something interesting. I I, I wanted to, uh, I, in fact, my my intention was to find every Christian academic who's written against the Quran. That was my thing, to see uh, how and why and what have they mistranslated of the Quran. And this was, in fact, a sticking point because these verses from Al Maida, uh, Ayah uh, one one six to one one eight. Uh, are, are very key. And in fact, even Christian missionaries, in fact, today use these kind of verses to make these false, false claims against Islam. Now, there's something interesting. And in fact, if you read the book, I have a lot of evidences in all the footnotes uh, about the way that Christian missionaries do not, in fact, quote the full context, all the full dialogue, in fact. In fact, I found none of them quote 116 to 118, in fact, none of them. Uh, and this is going back from John of Damascus, Thomas Aquinas, uh, you know, Billy Stico and Samuel Zwimmer, uh, William Lane Craig and uh, S- James Langford and so many of these famous kind of academic names. Uh, but they've never, in fact, translated uh, all three verses in the dialogue between Allah and his prophet Isa alayhi salam. Um, but this is this is kind of John of Damascus's attempt. So what does he say? He said, now, the, the verse on the right-hand side, of course, is a full verse translated from the Arabic into the English, and on the left is uh, is Damascus's attempt. So he says, now if, let, let's read, for example, the, the full verses first. He says, when Allah, when Allah says to Isa uh, 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 did you say to people, take me and my mother as two gods beside Allah? Ilahain min dunillah. Um, and he will say Subhanak. And even by the way, Subhanak is enough of a, of a, of a reputation because Subhanak, it means Allah, you're free of all imperfections, O oh Allah. You know, so it's, it's the word itself, Subhanak, when we when contemplates deeply is enough of a proof. I would never say that which I had no right to say. If I said such a thing, you would have known it. You know all that is within me, and though I do not know what is within you, you alone have full knowledge of, of things unseen. Then he says, I told them only what you commanded me to, which of course is that kind of very emphatic, unequivocal truth, even that survives in some uh, few verses in the Bible, I think, worship Allah, my Lord and your Lord, meaning that's worship Allah, uh, my Lord and your Lord. I was a witness over them during my time amongst them. Ever since you took my soul, you alone have been the watcher over them and you are the witness to all things into Adibhum, and if you punish them, then you are your servants, and if you forgive them, you are the Almighty and the All-Wise. Right? This is the full dialogue in those three verses of Ma'ida 106 to 118. Uh, now, the, the, the sad thing, of course, is that you won't find Christian missionaries quote these three verses when tied. I mean, that's the full dialogue. You won't find this. Uh, you'll find the first half of the first verse. That's very typical, right? And they say, therefore, Allah said, because they try and create this idea that the Muslim or the Quran has a trinity wrong in terms of uh, it's saying that uh, there is God and then there's Jesus and this is Mary. And so my whole chapter kind of discusses this whole thing about how this belief emerges and what the, what the Quran, in fact, does say, what it doesn't say. And during Damascus translates this. He says, oh, Jesus, did you say I'm the son of God and God? Now, of course, that's quite a problem. Isn't it? And Jesus answered saying, Be merciful to me, Lord. You know that I did not say that, nor am I too proud to be your servant. Errant men have written that I have made this declaration, but they are lying about me and they are the ones in error. John added, And according to them, God answered him saying, I know that you did not say these words. John commented thus, there are many other absurd stories worthy of laughter recorded in this writing, which he insolently boasts descended upon him from God. So, clearly not giving, therefore, the verses a fullness in his uh, in his translation of the of the, of the of the few parts of the of the, of those verses, and this, in fact, I I, I added it because this is a very c- c- common Christian trope. In fact, that they do it too often. So often, it's kind of it's very recognizable now by Muslims when they when they encounter Christians who rely on these verses. That number one, they're not going to translate the full three verses, and. They're going to miss out, of course, the most obvious one, the middle of one, where Allah is saying that Isa some said that I told them to worship only you, and uh, I could never tell them to worship myself, and all the amazing things, kind of a context of the verses. But this is kind of John Damascus and how he kind of, uh, his attempt uh, at these verses, and how he, like other missionaries even today, have mistranslated, part translated, you know, uh, half translated these uh, verses from the Quran. 
So now the actual Quranic verses, as opposed to John's distortions, are essential in underscoring the very problem the verses are intended to delineate that an appeal directly to Christian digression from the monotheism that Jesus taught and conveyed to his community. So kind of from my from my article. Now, that's kind of a few things about John of Damascus and his context and uh, what he's writing about Islam and where he's getting information from and uh, and the reason why. So a lot of, of course, of, of what he's writing, John Damascus, arises from his response to um, Muhammad as a heresiarch, uh, as kind of uh, Islam as a heresy. And, and he's seeing Islam as kind of very novel, big movement uh, that needs to be refuted for the purpose. But the point is this, it's not, it's not kind of that he's responding to Muslim or asking questions about Muslim claims. It's kind of he's outright lying about what Islam is and what the Quran represents. And that's the that's the tragedy, in fact, of of someone like him. And it's even more of a tragedy that, that you have Christian missionaries today that rely on people like him in their in his ignorance of Islam. And of course, it's kind of it's uh, doubled up in terms of their own ignorance. So this here in terms of just, just Thomas Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas is, as you can see from the dates, he's 13th century. So uh, a lot has happened uh, since that time in terms of Muslim Christian, um, you know, uh, relationship. Uh, a lot has happened in terms of the, the formative uh, impressions of what Islam is, those early kind of polemical works against Islam and then the Muslim works against Christianity, the Crusades. Uh, he's kind of in that context and you'll see that in a moment because he's from the order of preachers which is better known as dominicans and this was founded by dominic de guzman in 1216 to counter the heretical cathars cathars in fact were uh, a heresy and still are a heresy and the cathars are those who believe that kind of there's two powers of the universe a, a good power and an evil power uh devil is in control of one and the god in control of the other one and uh this although it became very popular in fact the cathar movement in l in l lb is in is in france and and they call it albigensian crusade because they believe that's kind of where the, the majority of them were in lb um and the the fourth crusade in fact was focused on defeating the 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 cathars in fact incidentally so it shows even the 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 end the movement of the crusade in fact developed over time because uh the it wasn't solely focused on uh restoring the holy land for example it kind of they could now announce a crusade the popes had that authority uh against anybody uh including of course the cathars and many people of course went and died you know for that purpose uh and uh, and were believed to be martyrs uh with forgiveness of sins at that time as well so uh if you look at thomas aquinas and his, his kind of context therefore you have the albigensian crusades so therefore very powerful in terms of rooting out heretics uh, 1252, you have, of course, the papacy and their permission uh, to engage in torture, torturous acts to root out heretics, you know. And this, of course, was something that became prominent in the, in the, in the Spanish Inquisition because you had these grand inquisitors, uh, from people like Thomas Tokamada, uh, Nicholas A. Merrick and their works on how to root out, um, you know, uh, uh, these kind of hidden moriscos and moriscas and and the hidden Jews who pretend to be Jews but they're in fact uh, in fact they're, they're Jews but they pretend to be uh, Christians and likewise for the Muslims and the fact they could use torture in fact as an instrument to um to uh to to extract this uh, information from them and so in 1215 the fourth Lateran Council required Muslims and Jews to wear distinguishing clothing. So all in the context, in fact, of Thomas Aquinas. Uh, Raymond of uh, Penafort encouraged Thomas Aquinas to write a book of Christian God doctrine called the Summa Contra, Summa Contra Gentiles, also known as Liber de Veritae Catholicae Fidei Contra Errores in Fidelium, book on the truth of the Catholic faith against the errors of unbelievers. Therefore, again, he's responding to uh, Islam as a, a false religion, as a heresy. And it's kind of a bit about the context of this individual. Um, now, uh, so what he does, Aquinas, is kind of he says very similar things about what Islam is, of who the Prophet was. Um, he kind of characterizes the Prophet 
uh, around a few a few common things. And so one of them, in fact, is that he says that Muhammad was a man of dunya, of a man of the world, of a man of temptation, of a man who kind of wanted the 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 things of this of this life, a man who loved women, for example, a man who kind of you kind of he showed the I mean in his characterizing he he, he kind of typified was um, as someone who was uh, not concerned with the the next world, more concerned with with this world. Uh, and that's kind of you know what attracted his followers to him, and of course misrepresented him, misrepresented the prophet's companions Abu Bakr, for example. Similar things he said about him as well, Rabbi Rawan. And so uh, here you have, of course, this is from Dikar called the Prophet Muhammad in Christian theological perspective in Islam in a world of diverse faiths. He says, with deference to Muslim sensitivity, I shall draw a veil over the absurdities and crudities of the medieval Christian character assassination of Muhammad in a polemical attempt to refute Islam. Suffice it to say that the massive literature, exhaustively analyzed by Norman, Norman Daniel in his Islam in the West, the making of an image, witnesses to an abject failure of Christian theology to deal creatively with a post-Jesus claimant to prophetic status as a recipient of divine revelation. Theological enterprise gave way almost entirely to fabulous. So this is really quite a good quote, actually, because he's really he nail on the head. Fabulous storytelling and slander. So therefore, mm. in their uh, misattempt to try and uh, understand what Islam was in this kind of opposed Jesus, uh, opposed Christianity uh, world, uh, where they saw perhaps that's going to be the the final kind of the final uh, say of of God in terms of human beings and the divine plan of all things, uh, they began to manufacture things and make things up and fabulous storytelling. And this, in fact, carried through all the way through in all these different examples of the Crusades and the Andalus and, and Aquinas and, and Damascus. And each one, of course, is adding to this, kind of adding his own flavor of of, uh, of misrepresenting what Islam actually is. And so, therefore, uh, Dikar, in fact, has it quite... Uh, neatly put over here. In fact, that's kind of a, a failure of the Christian world in, in, in attempting to do that. Um, now, Aquinas uh, has hardly a mention of the Prophet in his Summa Contra Gentiles, in fact, hardly a mention. Uh, Alfred Gul Gulam, of course, is the 19th century uh, Arabist, you know, who kind of uh, in fact, he has, in fact, a book on the life of Muslim even, and he has some criticism because of his kind of uh, either inadvertent or you know deliberate uh, mistranslations of some stuff. Uh, Gulam's uh, Gulam's work, uh, but in, in any case, in this context, he stresses how Contra Suma Gentiles uh, was written specifically to persuade Muslims in Spain to abandon Islam and convert to Christianity. Uh, at this point in the Summa Contra Gentiles, Aquinas has referred to Islam. He offers a brief tirade against Muhammad in which he claims that Muhammad's teachings are grounded in the promise of carnal pleasure and that they are not supported by miracles. Aquinas also says that Muhammad gained support by force of arms and that his teachings conflict with the Old and New Testaments. This is kind of what Aquinas' claims about Islam actually are. So if you can see like three or four claims here. One, and I, I think I list them in the next page. So uh, yeah, we are. So, okay. So uh, now Gulam's assessment, of course, in his work on uh, Aquinas says that he emphasized that Aquinas' criticism of Islam is a failure. That's kind of his words, a failure. He says, here we have Davies and B. Davies, this is his work on Thomas Aquinas' Summa Contra Gentiles, a guide in commentary that Davies acknowledged that Aquinas was not very well informed about Islamic thinking. So for a man who says he's never read the Quran on his and according to his own admission, never read the Quran, even though you have the Latin translations by that time, you have like uh, Robert Ketton, 12th century, uh, almost like paraphrasing the Quran into Latin, but he never read that even. Um, so he had no knowledge therefore of what Islam actually was. He never read Islam. Aquinas himself says he's never read it, the Islamic sources, even though he kind of criticizes the, the law code of Islam because I never had, I never went into, never had time to study the laws of the Muslims. So on his own admission, therefore, Aquinas is saying he has no knowledge of Islam, but but sadly still is used by Christian missionaries today as some kind of an authority on Islam. So people like Davies say, for example, he was not very well informed about Islamic thinking. Aquinas wrote another work entitled Reasons for the Faith Against Muslim Objections. Because Muslims are so materialistic, he says, Aquinas refuses to prove Christianity to Muslims since they can never understand what is beyond matter. 
right? So because uh, so immersed in dunya, in the world, they can't understand these heavenly things because they're so encapsulated by the trappings of the world. That's kind of Aquinas' perception of, of what Islam and uh, what Islam is. So if you look, therefore, at the kind of the, the key points that Aquinas makes against Islam, he says, Aquinas, number one, charges Muslims with excessive materialism. Um, all right. So obviously, any any Muslim would know, of course, how how incorrect that is. I mean, it's just crazy. I mean, the Quran, of course, is warning against that stuff you know, to be excessively in anything. Uh, Allah is saying in the Quran that don't be be cautious of these things in life. That these things, in fact, can have a, a damaging effect on a person's heart and a person's connection to Allah. A person's a focus on the akhirah, for example. If you're overly obsessively materialistic in life, it can have a damaging effect. Uh, and if you do have the the, the good finding of, of wealth and these things, all of this is a privilege from Allah, like the dua of Sulaiman in the Quran, for this is the grace of my Lord to test whether I'm going to be grateful or ungrateful. So we have these amazing paradigms in the Quran. But Aquinas, of course, ha has no understanding of any of that stuff. He just charged Muslims being materialistic. That Muslims deny miracles like the miracle of the Mass. So therefore, we don't regard the Mass, of course, as a miracle. But of course, the Quran is full of miraculous things. And of course, the Prophets of Allah, each of them had amazing miracles to convince their own people. And that's something that's essential into our, our belief uh, in, in in about them. Uh, and then he says, again, Muslims are carnal, only think of what is flesh and blood. Right, so uh, it's a, a, a sad, a sad because uh, if you think about the Quranic focus, is essentially on the the essence of things. Uh, Allah says it is not the essence of pilot you turn your face towards east or west. Allah says don't. And this is in fact the Mufassirin thing they say because a Sahaba they thought they uh, they thought they found the ultimate objective in the deen when the Qibla was changed from Jerusalem to Mecca. And Allah says that's not it. That's not the whole focus. The whole focus is something else. And Allah says you, know, you believe in Allah and then you give charity and then you have patience. All of these amazing things in fact come up from that. Um, likewise for example, salah is not just Allah says, Aqim uh, salata li dhikri, in establish salah for my remembrance, and Allah says, khushu, and all of these things, of course, are a reflection of that. And so uh, it's not about flesh and blood, but incidentally, of course, Allah in the Quran says, it is not uh, their meat or their yeah. blood that reaches Allah. It is your pie that reaches him. And so Allah is saying, therefore, that the the these kind of superficial things of meat and blood that you present are not what Allah is concerned about. Allah is concerned about with your piety, with your heart. Allah is concerned about that. And that's even, kind of even, even when it comes to paradise, uh, with all its pleasures, the, the greatest reward of paradise is seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah, for sure, for right? sure. You know, yeah. Everyone will be dropping yeah. and forgetting. About yeah. all the pleasures of paradise That's once right. you're able to see Allah That's right. I mean, the, 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 you know, the, the ironic thing when it comes to, I mean, Thomas Aquinas is a very influential and great thinker. I mean, that's just, a, you know, try to give credit where it's due. He's a, he's a brilliant thinker when it comes to areas yeah. of philosophical theology. Uh, yeah. His Summa Theologica contains a lot of brilliant, you know, uh, arguments, uh, uh, you know, proving the existence of God, refuting objections. Uh, but when it comes to Islam, subhanAllah, the, the quality of argumentation suddenly, you know, uh, yeah, yeah. just uh, absolutely it takes a downturn. Even with, even there are notable Christian apologists today who are absolutely brilliant when it comes to refuting atheists and are yeah, yeah. great thinkers. Yeah. But once they start opening their mouths about Islam, it's like a completely yeah. different person. Uh, it, yeah, it's not, I, just, it's not yeah. just that he's giving a wrong argument. It's uh, the, the quality of the argumentation, you know, yeah, yeah. Is, is not expected from, uh, you know, a layman, let alone a, a, a great yeah. thinker uh, or, or, or a great scholar. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, subhanAllah, and, and I guess it's just that Islam, I believe, you know, stumbles these people to the point where they have to resort to these desperate tactics. They have to exert yeah, yeah, exhaust so much effort defending their problematic doctrines yeah. um, and and you know even martin luther martin luther he said that one of the reason why uh you know uh that the christians were turning to some was because the religion of the turks did not have these problematic doctrines such as the incarnation the trinity 
And so they can't attack the core of the religion. They need to resort to these sorts, sorts of measures. Oh. Yeah, yeah, it's quite, it's quite sad. I mean, even uh, the book I wrote, in fact, is a is a response to William Lane Craig. Every chapter, in fact, is a response to one of William Lane Craig's arguments against Islam. But I found because I, I, in fact, I begin the book and end the book by by thanking him and praising him because of his great work against atheists. Mm-hmm. And of course, that's been praised by Muslims and, and people across the world. But that's, uh, of course, to to commend him for that. But when it comes to attempting to understand Islam, that's where the failure takes place. And I think that same is true with the, with Thomas Aquinas. Yeah. So for certain rights, Aquinas was deeply hostile to Islam and provides a deeply offensive and negative character of the life and teaching of Prophet Muhammad so the most repeated point Aquinas touches on in his critique of Islam was a physical pleasure found after the resurrection. Resurrection, the Quran stress on the pleasures of food and sexual relations in paradise proves Aquinas that Islam is a false religious. <laughs> Again, so the point, of course, you know, is that there is an abode in the dunya and there's an abode in the akhirah, and uh, Allah does not, uh, you know, Allah does not, uh, Allah, you know, affords the, the His servants, the believers in heaven, uh, a, a great quantity of of pleasures, and it. It, it kind of it, it goes against like for example if you say you would enjoy food in this life but then you can't enjoy it in heaven or you enjoy uh sexual relations in this life but you can't enjoy them in heaven it's kind of in a, it's counter to the whole the whole thing where allah says you know as a as a gift for his servants these things are allowed but the point is uh, and in fact as gifts from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but the point is is that the uh the uh the attempts at uh, uh, misrepresenting islam by focusing solely on these things, uh, as opposed to the fact that the Prophet ﷺ, you know, when he he lived a life was in in a lot of frugality and a lot of like uh, difficulty, that when uh, he didn't have, in fact, uh, his wife Aisha said that he never had more than two meals in a life in his life in a single day, that he had, you know, ba- he wouldn't eat meat often at all because you couldn't afford the meat and uh, and she said that the fire wouldn't burn for three months like you know in the house of Muslim, because we lived on a swadain of, of of water and of dates that when omar came and saw it, the fact that his his back had these marks where he would sleep on a mat of made of palm fiber and and omar says that i've seen the kings of of uh, of Rome and stuff and and they sleep on on fine mattresses and bedding and you are the messenger of Allah and, and the Prophet says and you aren't you pleased that they have the world the dunya we have the akhirah we have the next world and therefore the Prophet lived like that he didn't he left the world with nothing kind of he would give money and charity and that's kind of but the 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 fact that the focus is on these uh, points of food and sexual relations is really quite a striking thing it's it's, it's striking a uh, striking in, in terms of how how crazy the whole thing is and so this is a sketch of what aquinas says about rasulam that muhammad emphasized hedonistic pleasures right so of course you know it's like a crazy crazy thing and of course he was uh higher and, and higher than that so rasulam but that's kind of the way that christians like aquinas have uh characterized the Prophet uh, even though is even though his teachings go so against that and his life goes so so against that, um, he wielded the sword. Uh, well, of course, he fought in wars, but so too did the prophets of the Old Testament for fight in wars. Moses, Musa fought in wars. What does that say about anything? Um, and and even in the way that he fought against his enemies, I mean, it was he's still Allah says he's a rahman, uh, he's a most for all the worlds, including those of course because he fought against them. Uh, you know. And Allah, of course, says that you know the, the it's better, of course, that you have peace with people, uh, allowing them a chance to hear the message of Islam. All these amazing things. Uh, in, in my book on being human, I, I go through the the amazing, uh, empathic character of the Prophet and the way that his character, of course, is a reflection of human empathy in in all in all, in all cases, and even his enemies, for example, who would testify of his of his greatness, like the example of Thomama, the one who was prisoner of war, and he says. Uh, uh, I I know I I saw I I never hated a faith more than your faith. I never uh, hated a land more than your land. I never hated anybody more than you. 
and the Prophet would uh, go to him every day and say, what, what should I do with you, Uthamama? And uh, Uthamama said, well, you know, you have a choice. Either you could release me or this and that. And the Prophet goes the next day and says the same thing. And then the Prophet released him. And then the Uthamama said, I never found anybody I love more than I love you and a faith more than I love your faith. I mean, all of these are exa- exemplary codes of the magnanimity of the Prophet's character and his kind of remarkable way of, of creating this sense of of of, uh, of empathy and goodwill amongst people. Even his enemies, of course, admired him for that, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, his teachings contradict the Bible. Of course, uh, the Quran, of course, says a lot about the, 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 the falsity of previous dispensations. And of course, the Quran comes as a, as a clarification of of those of those of those faith of those beliefs, uh, Allah in the Quran says that we have made you an ummah and wasata, a, a balanced people between these two extremes of the Jews and of the Christians, and therefore the Quran you know affirms some things and it rejects nothing because that's the the Quranic way is to show therefore the the the, the previous errors and show them the truth of what really was and and it's another case a big point because the the Quran for example says uh, about one of the, the the most important if not the most important event. Uh, for Christians, of course, is the crucifixion. And Allah says, mm-hmm. that they didn't kill him, nor crucify him, because it was a made to appear thereof. And if it was that uh, Muhammad was interested in having the Christians uh, follow him, then that is simply the wrong thing to say if he was a charlatan and, and claim, com, coming out with this stuff. But of course, he's speaking, he's not speaking from his own desire except what, what Allah has de- de- revealed to him. And uh, in saying, therefore, that Christ was not crucified, it was a, a big thing because how can he deny something that we all believe in? Every Christian, every Christian denomination believes in, in crucifixion. And Allah is saying that's not true. And it's interesting because in my book, I go through this by looking at the way that the Quran, for example, figures crucifixion, uh, not, of course, as, as, as uh, not simply as a, a sole event, but in the broader context of salvation. Because the salvific function of Jesus Christ, of course, in the Bible is is essentially uh, uh, predicated on the fact that Adam, of course, has his failing in Genesis, and of course, Christ emerges as kind of a recapitulation, kind of taking the place of the first Adam, like Paul says in Corinthians, that because of the sin of one man, we're all condemned. Because of the sacrifice of one man, all of us are saved. And Jesus Christ is the second Adam in that. Um, and so Allah, when Allah says, for example, that they didn't crucify him, that the the primary emphasis is on Allah's mercy. And even in, even on the on the verses, for example, we have like let's say uh um uh when Allah says uh, the verse where Allah said that they say that the Rahman has taken a son. And Allah says it's a monstrous thing, and Allah says it's as if the heavens and the earth, uh, you know, the heavens are about to, 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 to fall, and the earth will split, and then, uh, and the older Rahman will, and and again Allah says that they say the most merciful has taken a son, and Allah says, um, uh, so you have, and in these verses, and even the next verse, wa ma'yambari lo Rahmani is not waiting for the most merciful one and Allah said the next verse after that that everything will come to Rahman uh, you know as, as, a, as, a, as a as a slave or servant so you find these four times Allah is emphasizing his Rahman is Allah being Rahman as opposed to Christians saying therefore that Christ emerges as a savior for the world as a as a as a kind of a a mercy for the world, you know, from God. And Allah is saying, but Allah is always a Rahman. And it's like Maryam, even when Maryam, when the angel comes to Maryam, and Allah in the Quran says, uh, the angel comes to Maryam, uh, as a handsome man, قالت, I seek refuge with Rahman from you. If you have, so Rahman has always existed in Maryam's life before even this, her son was, was born. And that's the that's the the, the primary the, the focus because it's not to uh, forget that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is Ghafir Dhan, but Allah is Qabil Allah is Rahman, uh, Allah is the Merciful One, and therefore uh, the whole kind of salvific notion of Christ is kind of really undermined in, in the face of all of that. Um, now Muhammad's religion is materialistic and led Muslims to reject many miracles. Islam focuses on physical pleasures and the afterlife. Muhammad was a rich man who lived in luxury. 
you know, so this is a kind of cla- crazy stuff uh, that Aquinas is bringing about uh, in terms of Islam. So, uh, now I've included here some examples from uh, non Muslim, like William Long, for example, uh, and his kind of uh, observation about things that were said by people like Aquinas and others in in the attempts of of uh, Christians to characterize uh, the image and the character of of the Prophet of Islam. He says that of the above criticism put forth by Aquinas, if I was specifically Aquinas here, in a bid to denounce Muhammad can find no support from the objective account of Muhammad's work. In the first place, there is no evidence to indicate that Muhammad promoted Islam by tempting prospective Muslims with sexual delights. Moreover, as stated before, the absence of miracles from Muhammad's ministry does not invalidate his claim. Of course, we believe many miracles, in fact, existed in the, in the, in the prophet's uh, uh, prophethood. Also, Aquinas' critique of the first Muslims as being brutal and ignorant men is grossly unfair. For instance, many of the first followers of Islam were young men who, from influential Meccan families. Business persons like Muhammad's first wife Khadija and the merchant Abu Bakr and others of similar status were among the first to embrace Islam. Of course, slaves were attracted to Islam with the most famous one being Bilal, a black Abyssinian. The pagans of Mecca opposed Muhammad and the early Muslims. Some of the said Muslims died with, under torture and others were sent to Abyssinia to escape persecution. Therefore, the first Muslims were sincere in their response to Islam. Can such ignorance, can such sincerity be equated with brutal and ignorant men? Further, it is untrue to assert that Muhammad coerced others by force to accept Islam. After 13 years of patient preaching and bearing with trials of all kinds in Mecca, Muhammad and his followers migrated to Yathrib. So quite quite a, quite a nice kind of a, uh, I think a response to uh, Aquinas here by William Long in his in his text about the way that about the fact that Christians like Aquinas have kind of repeated the same kind of uh, false allegations against Islam and they have no basis you know they have no basis in, in anything you know from the faith of Islam this is not another one from uh, William Montgomery more what uh that uh, Ghulam uh, uh, references he says that of all the world's greatest men none has been so much maligned as muhammad it is easy to see how this has come about for centuries islam was the greatest great enemy of christendom for christendom for christendom was in direct contact with no other organized states comparable in power to the muslims the Byzantine Empire, after losing its promises in Syrian Egypt, was being attacked in Asia Minor, while Western Europe was threatened through Spain and Sicily. Even before the crusade focused attention on the expulsion of the Saracens from the Holy Land, medieval war propaganda, free from the restraints of factuality, was building up a conception of the great enemy. At one point, Muhammad was transformed into Mahound, the Prince of Darkness. By the 11th century, the idea about Islam and Muslims current in the crusading armies was such travesties that they had a bad effect on morale. The crusaders had been led to expect the worst of their enemies, and when they found many chivalrous knights amongst them, they were filled with distrust for authorities of their own religion. Like, <laughs> why did he send us <laughs> to, to war? Uh, the examples of people like Salah Hadin, for example, or Yubi, Nur Din Zengi, amazing characters who really, uh, you know, showed the Christians. In fact, in fact, Salah Hadin's uh, beautiful account, I think it was in Tyre when the Christian woman was uh, came, came to plead because someone took her son, you know, and or her daughter, I think it was, and then you know, she's coming and she's she. In fact, in one account, she asked the Christians, "Can I go and see Salah Hadin?" And they said that you can because we see him as a person of nobility and 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 uh, and goodness. And she went to him and she asked, "Can I?" Uh, and she's crying. And Ibn Shaddad, in fact, biographer says that I saw, I saw Salah Hadin and the woman standing together, and they're both crying. And they're both crying. And he had this great sense of empathy you know, for the woman <laughs> because uh, her child was taken. And then she's begging for help, and then she, he takes his own money and gives it to people because his fear was that it could be sold in a black market. And he gives her money, and uh, and uh, when they find the child, and she's kind of, uh, you know, she's uh, she's crying and she's prostrating on the floor, 
and uh, and the account Ibn Shaddad says, I, I saw both of them weeping in this. So he has this amazing character of of, of humanity and mercy and magnanimity in his character, as well as being, of course, chivalrous in his fight against the Franks and the Crusaders. And the Crusaders. Um, but what it is, it kind of reverses and it transforms the perception that people have of, of Muslims. And it's like, for example, the perception that Christians came to have the Visigoths of, of Andalus when they're living with the Muslims. And they, they love the fact that Muslims are kind of, uh, are so engaged in in sciences and and religion and building all these amazing schools and you have people like you know Petrus Alfonsi, Michael Scott, at a lot of bar these kind of these were like the 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 people who kind of sowed the seeds of the Renaissance who came and studied of course with the Muslims of Torino and Cordoba and is seeing uh, the greatness of, of of the Islamic spirit um, as well as the fact that you know Muslims are living together fine with Jews and Christians and kind of giving them positions of of of, of nobility and giving them positions of of of, of of status you know, in the societies. Um, and then, of course, living with the Muslims in, in other parts of the world, like in Asham, for example, or in uh, uh, Al-Quds, for example, and they're seeing the fact that Muslims are not harming us, they're in fact providing for us and giving us uh, many privileges in society. And the fact that John of Damascus, in fact, was working under the Umayyads, him and his whole family, his grandfather, for example, uh, is the case in point you know, for that. So uh, Thomas Carlyle, uh, who was amongst the first people to speak uh, against the Christian lies against the Muslim, says our current hypothesis about Muhammad that he was a scheming impostor, a falsehood incarnate, that his religion is a mere mass of quackery and fatuity, begins really to be now untenable to anyone. The lies which well-meaning zeal has heaped around this man are disgraceful to ourselves only. Right? And that's quite a powerful quote, therefore, because it's saying, therefore, that... Uh, you know, we are caught, we are now of course living in the twenty twenty first century, and uh, the lies that uh, Christians uh, in their attempt to try and maybe there might have been some a few sincere attempts to try and understand what Islam actually was, uh, but the, the 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 problem is in terms of is in terms of being so uh, factually ignorant and being so lacking in diligence and trying to find out what Islam actually represents. That's the that's the that's the that's the problem. Uh, but he's saying Khalil that none of those things work anymore because people, of course, have risen in terms of their knowledge and can read around these kind of uh, artificial. Uh, claims against uh, the Prophet of Islam. Uh, now, th- I'm going I'm to end, inshallah, here, but the point is that I, I, I end the article, in fact, by saying that these are not new accusations, that the Makkans of Quraysh, of course, had a lot of stuff to say uh, about the Prophet Islam as well. Uh, and they were saying all sorts of things, and they were trying to misalign, and trying to characterize his his character, and trying to, um, you know, uh, impute all sorts of wrong things upon him, Zalam, in their attempt, of course, to win people back to paganism as opposed to Islam. Uh, and that's something that the Quran, of course, uh, tells us about. And Allah says that we are well aware that your heart is weighed down by what they say. And it's beautiful, in fact. And this, of course, is a, is a great proof against people like Aquinas and Damascus who were saying that, like the ones that we read before about the fact that Islam is all focused on the material world and we can't understand the heavenly stuff. And Allah says, uh, uh, celebrate the glory of your Lord and be amongst those who bow down to him. Worship your Lord until what is said it comes to him and death comes to you. I mean, the, the prescription, in fact, in the Quran through and through, whenever these kind of verses are mentioned, is Allah says, That's kind of, you know, so you find it in a few places in the Quran that Allah said, Be patient what they say against you and remember your Lord. Celebrate the praise of your Lord in the morning and evening of the day, meaning just be engaged in remembering Allah. And and here you have a very beautiful example of that. So Allah says, you know, just about finding solace in the fa- face of such derision, Quran calls on him to. Now this, of course, this is from Surah Shura. This is kind of a Makki Surah. And uh, it's interesting because Allah says here, Isbir be patient with what they say about you. Now Dawood, of course, David is not from the landscape of the Hijaz, he's from you know, uh, Al-Quds from Jerusalem is from that part of the world. And it's interesting that Allah, uh, in that very early kind of very formative moment in the prophet, prophetic life, is saying, remember David, remember Dawood. Uh, because all prophets, of course, are, the, the prophets says, are, are brothers to one another. Their mothers are different, but their religion is the same. And Allah says, remember Dawood, 
they'll aid a man of strength. But this is strength of obedience to Allah. That's where his power is. And Allah says, indeed, he constantly turned to Allah. Uh, we, we truly subjected the mountains to him, uh, our praises along with him in the evening and, and afternoon. I mean, Allah is saying, therefore, that as he's, Allah says, إِنَّهُ awab. Awab is the one that's always returning his affairs back to Allah. And Allah says, we cause the mountains around him and the birds above him to remember Allah with him. And Allah says, كُلُّهُ awab." All of them were awab. All of them were returning their affairs back to Allah. And Allah goes on to say, therefore, uh, some ayat later that we blessed him with a pious son, uh, meaning Sulaiman alayhi salam. And Allah says, إِنَّهُ awab." He too is awab. The beautiful thing, I know, I think, as a as a as a way for us as Muslims to understand this stuff is that that you will always have uh, antagonists, you will always have detractors, you will always have people who will say cruel things about about our faith. But the prescription here we have in 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 these verses is that Allah is telling Prophet you carry on with what you're doing, carry on and remember Allah. And Allah will make the world around you remember Allah with you. Like Allah made the mountains and the birds remember Allah with Sulaiman, so with Dawood alayhi salam. Allah is saying, remember that, remember that power. Because if you carry on, Allah will make the world remember Allah with you. And that's really the key thing for us, to carry on in, in the path of da'wah, carry on the path of learning of Islam, uh, of showing goodness and kindness to one's neighbors, showing is exemplifying Islam. And uh, and Allah, of course, is the turner of hearts, and Allah is the transformer of all affairs. And so uh, I thought kind of, uh, you know, the, uh, the article was important to write in terms of um, you know, showcasing, uh, and uh, again, the kind of the, the, the falsity of narratives that Christian missionaries uh, bring up using these two characters of John of Damascus, Thomas Aquinas. And even though, of course, like you mentioned, Thomas Aquinas is, is celebrated because of his amazing achievements in other fields, the point is that when it concerns something as crucial and as big as Islam, uh, we should be we should have something to say about that because otherwise we're we're, we're missing the mark ourselves, you know. So uh, I want to thank you again, Brother Bassam, for the time you've spent with me and invitation to come on blog mythology and, and sharing uh, my thoughts and ideas. Zakhmala Khairan. Barakallahu Dr. Uthman, for this, uh, you know, very educational presentation. And, you know, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, you know, to guide the sincere amongst, you know, the Christians to, mm, I mean. to, to enable them to rise above these false polemics mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. to, you know, assist them in uh, acquiring, uh, you know, uh, you know, access to more truthful sources about Islam so that they may they may judge it for for what it really for what it really is. I mean, uh, before we let you go, uh, Dr. Fahmal, I was hoping to ask you a few questions. I mean, in your opinion, do you feel that Christian polemics today has you know have evolved since Aquinas and John of Damascus's time? Well, the fact they're still using the arguments of Aquinas and, and mm. <laughs> the, the mm. fact that some of them, I mean, not all of them, but some of them are still using those arguments and using his his words and putting them on on video is is is, is a sad kind of uh, uh, testament to the fact that perhaps they haven't, in fact, uh, evolved. Uh, but however, we, Allah in the Quran says, "Leisu sawa." They're not all the same, and and they're not all the same. And you find for uh, other better attempts at trying to better understand Islam. The people, the Christians who come to the mosque, for example, Masjid, we sit with them. And they want to learn more about Islamic faith, and I think that those are very kind of uh, good good efforts amongst amongst people trying to better understand the faith of Islam. Uh, and I think that uh, you know everyone has to be sincere. I mean, the the more sincere a person is, the more kind of uh, sincere they're going to be. Sincere they're going to be in terms of attempting to try and find uh, the truth of of a matter. And I think that applies for all of us. I think that if we we have to be sincere in terms of how we engage with Christians, how we learn about Christianity, or whatever. And they have to be sincere in how they learn about Islam. So I think that there's going to be good and bad. There's going to be those who still are kind of caught up in the mindset of, of otherness and, and demonizing and, and they, and because it's a way of validating their own existence, their own faith. Um, one, one of the ways that, you know, the other is created through self. So we have selfness and otherness. So you, you can't have otherness. You can't have the other without the self. So, once you create the self as this kind of uh, perfect being, uh, then it's easy, easy to create the other because the other is is a counter to the greatness of oneself. And I think that 
that seems to be uh, the, on the minds of these uh, detractors like Aquinas or Damascus because they're fighting against heresies and and uh, whether it's the Cathars or Algensians of, of Aquinas or the early ones of uh, um, the, the iconic class, you know, of, of what he's dealing with uh, in Damas- on Damascus. Um, the danger is, of course, is if you if you use that kind of as a paradigm for life, you're going to miss the mark in many ways, I think. And I think that happened, of course, with these two individuals. Uh, and I think that Christians should know better not to do that, you know, again, now, of course, because it's a reflection of, of a lack of sincerity, and in fact, for all people. And so that's what I would say. Would you say that, you know, that maybe, maybe, would you say that there, that the world has changed in some relevant ways since Aquinas and John's time, uh, which could have a more positive direct impact on Muslim Christian dialogue today. So, you know, globalization, um, you know, uh, you know, we're not in this, in the, in, in the kind of state of religious war as we were back in the days with the crusades mm-hmm. and whatnot. What do you, do you think that th- the times have changed in some relevant ways or perhaps even remain mm-hmm. the same in other, uh, uh, negative ways? Perhaps. I mean, do you have any thoughts on that? I think that, uh, one of the things we have a better access to information nowadays i think that people of course can watch and learn and read uh, more is available in terms of uh, things that can edify them about uh, about the islamic faith and i think that that availability of information in fact is very different because in those times you didn't have that much available except that you would of course rely on what the priest says about maybe you're illiterate and you rely on what the priest says about islam and therefore that's enough to convince you uh but nowadays of course we had a one we had one uh brother took shahad alhamdulillah in in belfast in in ireland and i was asking him and he says he went to he went to his uh church and uh to ask about Islam and the and the priest went like crazy on him uh, and began to like the similar stuff like I, I assassinate the character of Salam and against the Quran and this and that and that for him in fact was uh, uh, was kind of a signal he should be learning more about Islam uh, because that reaction in fact provoked in him Alhamdulillah he took you know he became Muslim he took Shahad Alhamdulillah but it pro- kind of provoked in him this kind of a deeper curiosity about what Islam actually is um, and so you know on the one hand of course you're going to have better access to information nowadays and it's like you have TV stations we have Muslims all over the U- internet and YouTube and everything people can have much better access to Islam um, however at the same time remember that everyone is different and so we speak about crusades of of the past we also have wars in our present times uh, as well we have the war in iraq for example um there's a good book by uh, susan faludi called the terror dream um it's about the way that you know the the war in iraq or after 9 11 these kind of uh you know social cultural codes of um of, of american exceptionalism became very paramount in american media and discourses and that kind of set the stage in fact for that self other kind of uh dichotomy and uh, when that happened then it was much easier in fact for some to be maligned it was much easier for some to be seen as the other because you've already created a sense of selfness through american exceptionalism and that can happen of course in any situation because uh war can create that whether it's the crusades or it's a war in iraq that that does happen that can happen um but then again at the same time or you you understand that islam grew so much after 9 11 and uh you know people are interested in reading about the quran and 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 this of course the individual conscience of a, of a person this is of course all of it is built upon the guidance from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um you know i think that people have to just uh you know we had a uh, one we had a a, a, a a jewish man became muslim just a few weeks ago and he goes he said, how can I become Muslim? He said, he said, how can I become Muslim? He said, everybody I know in my life is Jewish. He said, my, my siblings, my parents, my neighbors, my doctor, my teacher, all Jewish. And I said to him, yeah, but isn't God big, bigger than that? Isn't Allah, isn't God bigger than that? 
and he's from Wisconsin, from America. And uh, he said to me, but uh, if uh, how can I become Muslim? When How can I tell my mom? Because she's going to be so upset by the fact that I become Muslim. And I said, uh, yeah, but the God that you're seeking is the same one that controls your mother's heart. You know, and that's the point. So uh, we should not forget that. Allah is in control of, of his affairs. And Islam, of course, will, will enter into every single home. And I mean, Islam will rise from all these places. And uh, Alhamdulillah, we're seeing, we're seeing that all over the world. But the point is, of course, for us to be... Um, to be genuine in our sense, to be caring, to be compassionate. Uh, at the end of my book on being human, I have a chapter on Rwanda, 1994, and I and I focus on Rwanda as kind of as a paradigmatic case because uh, in Rwanda uh, we have this amazing sense of dawa through actions, dawa through life saving. Uh, because in Rwanda, you know, you had like from April to June, like 1900 days, uh, almost a million people got killed in the Rwanda genocide. And uh, that's a kind of a Catholic uh, fight because Rwanda, uh, Hutus and Tutsis are both Catholic, but you have like 4% Muslim. And uh, amazing, amazing courage from the Mufti of Rwanda, Mufti Salah Abiyaman in those days. And he kind of gave this uh, teaching to the Muslims that we have to now work on saving lives. And and he said that, you know, you have to make sure the, the doors of the mosques are open. And, and b before that time, by the way, they used to believe that uh, demons are in mosques, you know, and that you're not allowed to because the devil's in the mosque. And uh, they never entered the mosque before. But the situation created this uh, sense of desperation where the only place they have to run to is now a mosque because that's the only place where... And, and missionaries were, would... And Christians would, would barricade the monasteries and, and lock them. But, but he gave the command that you have to leave the mosques open and Muslim women would give like the hijabs you know to the other Christian women and the prayer bees to, to disguise them as Muslims but the the number of uh, you know Islam skyrocketed in fact the conversion rate after genocide came to an end because people wanted to be like the Muslims like the sense of you you saved our lives in this time and uh, and it kind of led to this amazing interest in what Islam accurate and the dawah efforts increased and uh, amazing this is a very good kind of uh, uh, articles, even if you're going to Google now from the New York Times about the number of conversions, uh, you know, to Islam in Rwanda after 1994, are, you know, very big numbers. And I think that we have to always show that sense of uh, uh, of greatness of character as a reflection of dawah, as well as, of course, our uh, the, the goodness of of of, of our words. I mean, when you when you look at you know contemporary Muslim Christian discourse. Would you say that there are any that there are some areas of improvement that you would like to see? Yeah, so you know, I, I think I think so. One of the things I began the book with a divine perfection is by saying that um, I I think in the course of my 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 studies at least I think that. Uh, I think that what's happened, what I think happens is that, and I think this is a good debate to be had, of course, it's good to be having these debates about things like Jesus Christ, is, is Jesus God, for example, or Trinity or uh, crucifixion. These are very important debates for us to have with Christians. But I think that there's kind of uh, kind of uh, something uh, more uh, formative. It's more kind of... Uh, more early than that, in fact, as a debate. Uh, and in the book, I kind of show these Christian atonement theories. And I say that, look, the point is that Christians uh, have, in fact, struggled throughout the history in making sense of the need for uh, Christ as Redeemer. It's not as simple as people think it is, actually, because if you look at the evolution of these Christian atonement theories from people like Irenaeus and then Gregory of Nyssa and then Anselm and others, uh, they're all trying to build on, on something. So, for example, you have the Christus Victor theory and you have a devil ransom theory and the idea that you know when when Adam sins, then the the then gonna the the devil takes over the world, and and God sends Jesus as, as a ransom to the devil. That kind of was the theory for almost a millennium. People believed that for nine hundred years. Uh, people believed that was the main theory, and uh, then you had others like the fish hook theory, where 
God sends Jesus as a kind of a bait for the devil. Devil doesn't know, in fact, that he's incarnate God, and therefore he's happy that a holy man has died, but then it turns out to be that he's the incarnate God, and then the plan of the devil is foiled. Uh, then, of course, you have Anselm builds on this in 12th century in the satisfaction theory because he says that, no, it's about the fact that when God was wronged by Adam, uh, you know, there was a kind of a blemish on his honor, and you can't, I can't, you can't, we can't uh, repair the damage done because we're all unworthy. We're not holy like God, and only God Himself can do it. Therefore, God becomes incarnate and and pays the price back to Himself. This is why His book is called Cordua's Homo: Why God Became Man. And then, of course, Calvin builds on this in his own theory on on penal substitution. So, all of these, in fact, are trying to make sense of the fact that uh, you know. Christ needed to become an incarnate, yeah? So sometimes, for example, when we say, for example, when Christians say, when we debate with, uh, is is Jesus God? The, the question to us is, why, um, why does God need to become an incarnate? And I think that that's fundamental because that's where Christians begin the debate from, about the fact that they accept almost as, as fact that Christ is God, and therefore the crucifixion has to happen because it has to happen because of X, Y, and Z. But the point is this, is that uh, Allah, therefore, denies the event of the crucifixion, but the, the premise is if you compare, for example, Genesis, where Adam has what's called the fall, uh, with Al-Baqarah, where Allah says, uh, that they both, shaitan made them both slip, and then they were expelled for the word. And the next ayah, ayah 37, is so profound. In fact, I have it in my book, I call it the Adamic conundrum, that, that whole section. And uh, and in that verse, Allah says, Adam kalimatin rahim. Now, this verse is so key, in fact, I think, because uh, Allah says uh, that Adam receives words from his Lord, and this is words of inspiration, Allah teaching Adam what to say to us for forgiveness. And Allah's, Allah being Al-Qarib, Allah being the ever near one, Allah being the ever accepting one, all this is reflected in, in the in what Allah does to his servant. Allah doesn't, in fact, in, in the book I go through this kind of... Uh, uh, the Christian uh, hamatiology of sin through Adam. So Dr. Luganville, for example, says that when Adam sins, he goes into three types of damnation, or physical damnation, spiritual, and, and, and eternal damnation, meaning Adam has to be condemned because if he's not condemned, then Jesus Christ makes no sense. That's the whole point. Christ comes to take the place of Adam's sin in the first place. So Allah is saying that not Allah is saying, in fact, so remarkably that uh, uh, that uh, Allah showed Adam, meaning Allah taught Adam words of inspiration, how to ask for forgiveness. And then Allah says, "Fataba alay." This is Allah relenting to Adam. This is Allah turning to Adam before even Adam gets a chance to ask Allah for forgiveness. Allah has turned to Adam, and it's a beautiful thing about Allah's forgiveness and mercy and Allah's closeness, and. Uh, Oftentimes, Christians might say, for example, that maybe this is an example of Allah's uh, maximal perfection of forgiveness being shown to his first human creation, Adam. But you have this amazing paradigm in reflected in his his progeny. For example, the sons of Adam in Surah at Tawbah, the, the example of the three who remain behind in Tabuk. And these were believers who made excuses, and Allah says about the three who remain behind until the, uh, you know, the, the earth became tied for them, even though earth is spacious. And well, Daqat Alim and Fusum and their soul became constricted. Well Dhanu and they realized and they knew, sorry, Wal Dhanu, that there's no uh, refuge from Allah except by going back to Allah. Thumma taba alayhim liyatubu. And this is the key thing. Thumma taba alayhim liyatubu. Then Allah turned to them so that they turned to him. See so Allah is from Allah's karam. Allah is al-kareem. Allah, Allah turns first. Allah turned to them before. Now this is amazing, beautiful paradigm because it kind of juxtaposes the way that Christians have created this image of the fall, and then therefore because of the fall, then Jesus Christ has to come as a kind of redeem and savior. But Allah is saying, but Allah Allah was always a forgiven one. Allah was always the most, Allah was always a close one. Allah was always the accepting one. And I think that that's kind of a, I think that we should bring the debate back to there mm. because everything else is a is a consequence of where where they would like the narrative to stop they, they would like narrative to start from this point but Allah is saying what about what about this earlier point because if you understand this then there's no need for any of the stuff that comes later mm. uh, and I think that it'd be good for for us to kind of maybe uh, focus a bit more on that inshallah barakallahu feekum, barakallahu feekum. any final words you'd like to leave the listeners with before we 
in the discussion. Yeah, may Allah bless you. Thank you for the again for inviting me. It's actually very kind of you. Um, you know, I, I end the book, in fact, my book, by speaking about a man called uh, Samuel Zwimmer. Mm. Uh, Samuel Zwimmer, of course, was a uh, was a missionary. In fact, in the nineteenth and twentieth century, he he lived with the Muslims. You know, he lived. He went all over the Muslim world, and he kind of. Uh, tried to convert Muslims to Christianity and share the message of Christianity with them. But in the beginning, he was very kind of hostile, in fact, to Islam. He was kind of, uh, he disparages Muslim, it's the Quran and, and the Prophet, the character and this and that. And even he goes against the names of Allah and all these kind of stuff, you know. But there's something remarkable about Zwimmer by the end of his life because he turns into this reluctant admirer, in fact, of, of Prophet Sallam. Uh, he uh, says that Muhammad was one of the greatest souls God ever created. You know, and, I didn't know that. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I have it in my book. You know, he said one of the greatest souls God ever created because he brought the Arabs back to monotheism. And uh, and I think that he's quite a good example because he's an example of someone who knew very little in the beginning, but then knew much more by the end. And it just shows the the, the power and effectiveness of of learning, of, of reading more, of, of being more kind of adept in terms of our research and stuff. And I think that, and that's kind of quite hopeful because it shows that, um, you know, lives can change, people can change, and we should not, therefore, uh, put everybody into one particular bracket and say, this, this is how they are, they're going to say, it, because that's a kind of a way of, 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 of otherizing. And I think that, like you mentioned, there are, of course, all the Christianity is not one monolithic group, it's a range of all people. And there are people who are not like Aquinas and not like Jonah Damascus, and people who don't even read their stuff. And they're more open hearted and more kind of genuine in their faith. And, uh, um, and there are there are those who are on the other side, and we have to kind of differentiate between people in life. Um, my advice, therefore, is to be, uh, you know, be kind of uh, compassionate and merciful in the way that we approach people with the message of Islam um, to show them the the truth of of the prophetic character to live as a good Muslim because our living, in fact, reflects uh, what we believe to be true in the prophetic character and wanting to be like him. And that, in fact, is 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 a is a big cause of uh, of people being uh, impressed, in fact, by by Muslims because of what they see of our truthfulness and our character. In fact, remember that when the people, the Christians of Najran came and they said, to, uh, said Ya Rasulullah, ibad lana rajul amin, send us a truthful person, and they could have said, send us uh, the most wealthy or the bravest, but they said, send us a truthful person. The Prophet says, I'm going to send to you uh, rajul and haqq amin, haqq amin, a person who's truly truthful. And every Sahabi thought that he would send him, but he didn't. He sent Abu Bayd and Jarrah. And, and the Prophet says every every nation has a truthful one, but our truthful one is Abu Jarrah. And, and in the Khilaf of Umar al Khattab, he once said to his people, you know, to man, make a wish in one mic up, and he says, I wish I, I, wish I had a whole room full of gold and silver, I would spend it in Allah's cause. Then he asked, make a wish again, and he says, a man could have been, so I wish I could have, have, have the whole room full of uh, jewels and, and pearls and rubies. I would spend them in Allah's cause. Again, he asked, make a wish. And a man got up and says, why didn't you make a wish? And Omar says, if I was to make a wish, I would, I would wish for the whole room full of men uh, like Abu Ben Jabarra. And uh, because it's not just gold and silver that would fix our problems, it's men of transparency and and goodness and and honesty that would have a, a big effect. So may Allah bless you, brothers, but it's for your amazing work and may Allah increase you in goodness and the great work of blogging theology. I want to thank you again for inviting me uh, to this uh, presentation. Zabal Khairan. Barakallahu feekum, barakallahu feekum. Uh, very happy to have you here. And, uh, and inshallah, we, uh, I'm sure we all greatly benefited from this presentation. And uh, I think we uh, this is a good place to conclude. I'll, I would like to part you and our listeners with the Islamic readings of Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.